Welcome to Worship Online. We are glad that you've joined us. If you're new, I'm Pastor Josh, and we are going to be worshiping through our time in the Word today. We're going to be in the book of James again, and before we begin, I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, today as we open your Word, wherever it is people are at as they are worshiping, as they are listening in, I pray that you would bless those, Lord, that have tuned in, and I pray that you would allow all of us, as we look to your word, we look to James 5, uh, that you would convict us and guide us and equip us to take our next steps of faith, and that we would rely wholly on the person of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us on the cross. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, these days, the stories in our movies and our novels are enamored with the concept of multiple universes. Or as it has been coined when you put those two words together, multiple and universe, the multiverse. The idea is uh, that different realities exist based on all the different choices we make on a daily basis, moment by moment. Uh, The Marvel superhero movies are all about this right now, but this storytelling device is actually not new at all. It's been around a long time. Uh, The 1946 movie, It's a Wonderful Life, is really the story of imagining a different reality where the values of community and friendship and prayer are pitted against desperation, wealth, and greed. And near the end of that black and white movie, There is this haunting picture of an alternate reality without the kindness and integrity of the main character, George Bailey, uh, played by Jimmy Stewart. And that's just an imaginative look forward down the corridor of time that's similar to the 1843 novel, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, with the ghost of Christmas future showing Ebenezer Scrooge where his bad choices will lead. And what happens in the end of both of those stories is that the the main characters change as a result. There is in their lives a change in action based on a change of heart. These characters got to see the vision of a bleak and vivid future reality based on bad choices. And the outcome in their lives was a form of repentance. People have actually been captivated with this idea since ancient times. There is a Jewish fable from 100 BC that is essentially the story of a person falling asleep and waking up in a bleak future. And the story was written in order to help us change our lives right now. Same storytelling technique, same teaching principle. It's an, it's, it's an imaginative way of asking what if. I think as Christ followers, the use of this kind of tool in movies and books can actually be a good motivator. It can be a call for personal change and possibly an open door for dialogue with the world around us. Maybe we could see these stories as a kind of an exercise where we use our imagination and we look down the corridor of time and we consider the impact of our choices and our character and our way of life especially when the possibility yields a bleak and a vivid display of a bad outcome. And then we use that. We use that thought process as a call to change, to repent, to choose the way of character and hope and dependence on Jesus, to live in the light and life of Christ instead of the path that leads to darkness and death and an eternity separated from God's loving presence. Essentially, that's what we have before us in this week's passage in the book of James. So if you have the ability to look at scripture with me while I look at it, I'm going to be in James 5, verses 1 through 8 today. We had originally planned on going just through verses 1 through 6, but that would be exclusively looking at a bleak future. And I wanted to at least look at a portion of hope and light and life. So we extended the passage through to verse 8. So what we're going to do is look at this passage, which first offers an option that is dark and bleak, as James essentially 
looks down the corridor of time and paints a word picture based upon the life of an arrogant, greedy person whose priorities are all out of whack. But then he offers another possibility that is light and hopeful as he paints a different picture altogether, one that's based on the kind of patience that we can know through faith in Christ. So our plan is to look first at a bleak future vision in verses 1 through 6, the darker alternative based on sin, followed by a hopeful imminent reality in verses 7 through 8, this brighter preferred life experience. A bleak future vision and then a hopeful imminent reality. Two alternatives. Two, basically, it's almost like two alternative universes that we can live in available to us in this life and the life to come. All right. So the first is a bleak future vision. James actually gets really graphic and detailed about how bad this reality is will be. And we're going to take this verse by verse through this passage, starting with James 5.1. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Now, get used to this because for the next six verses, this is the tone. And again, it's like James is calling us to use our imagination And picture this bleak possible future when our lives orbit 100% around wealth and fail to consider the reality and priority of the presence of God and his will in our lives. James says in in verse 1, come now, which is this signal. He he had that same phrase in James 3.13. It's this signal for us that he's, he's calling us to learn from what he's about to say. He's in teaching mode. It's a style that echoes the Old Testament prophets. And he refers then to you rich. Come now, you rich, who would have likely been the wealthy business and landowners at the time. And it's right where we need balance. This part in in considering what James has to say to us today, where, where we need balance. Uh, There is in the original language and context within this phrase and the way James uses it, a combination of literal financial wealth. He is literally talking about caution around wealth, financially. But also there is this relation to the kind of sinful injustice that some of the wealthy at the time uh, lived out. And so it's those two things sort of overlap when he says, you rich. He's referring to the literal financial wealth, but also the sinful injustice built into that phrase. So here's where the balance comes in. These rich will be condemned in this passage and in the life to come. Not simply because they're wealthy, but because of the way they use their wealth. So applying the passage to all wealthy people would be misreading the text. But then again, we can't avoid the sobering reminder that wealth itself poses a danger to our souls. It's not for nothing that Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to inherit the kingdom of heaven. So I hear James saying at the outset of this new section of the letter in James 5, listen to me, you wealthy non-Christians who are oppressing the poor, But also listen to me, you who are followers of Christ and wealthy and are reading this letter as well. Show some sorrow, some fear for the coming consequences of injustice that revolves around the prioritization exclusively of wealth. James is writing this to believers as a way of saying, you too could go down this road, so be careful. The words weep and howl are used a lot in Old Testament prophecies. The Greek word for howl is an onomatopoeia. It's a Greek word that sounds like howling. It's like, oh, 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 oh. It it sounds like howling. Uh, And 
it's a word that is used in the Old Testament often to get people to realize you need to change. God wants his people to care. God is so concerned for the poor throughout the Bible and so clear in calling his people to care that one can make a case that Israel's defeat and exile into Babylon around 600 B.C. was really based on their disobedience around this aspect of God's call for his people. This aspect of caring for the poor and the marginalized and the helpless. We hear this caution loud and clear in the Old Testament prophets. We hear this in the words of Jesus, and we hear this in the last book of the Bible in Revelation 18. This is God's heart for us, his people. We are called to care. And James is just waving the red flag big time because these rich are not caring. He goes on in verses 2 and 3. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and your and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. One scholar called this Greek portion of the text disjointed. Dis, uh, it, it's not, there, there are no conjunctions. It's just a disjunction. It's just phrases joined together. It's like word pictures that are just piled up again and again. In my imagination, I can... The way James writes, I can see the vivid, horrific scene, uh, almost like I'm watching this on an HD, a giant TV, a bleak future, a dystopian post-apocalyptic landscape, uh, rotted riches, disintegrating garments, corroded coins, and then the rot and corrosion somehow eating away at the flesh of those in judgment like fire, like the scene at the very end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. These rich people selfishly laid up treasure in the wrong place and in the wrong way. They treasured the wrong pursuit. And there is actually a sense in the tense of the verbs that the beginning of that corrosion and that rot and that disintegration is starting right now. The erosion has already begun. I think of the way children, uh, or adults for that matter, can build sandcastles uh, on the beaches near the ocean. And, and, and they spend hours with pails and shovels uh, building turrets and, and moats and, and walls. Uh, but the tide begins even in the late afternoon, and it begins to swallow up their efforts on the front edge of their sandcastles as they leave for the day, and then they return the following day with no sign whatsoever of their work. Um, It's like that, as James describes uh, the way we store up treasure in this life and how off, how, how fruitless, how pointless that is. And it's, it's also, uh, Really, it it shows us the consequences of this injustice and how serious they are. Verse 4. Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Uh, Here again in the language of James, we get this almost uh, cinematic picture of wages crying out, the wages themselves crying out uh, as the farmers are also crying out. I can kind of picture that, can you? The sounds and the cries of injustice. In other passages of Scripture like Leviticus 19.13, we hear the same concern. God's heart for his people to truly care for the poor and the helpless is all over Scripture. Leviticus 19.13, do not defraud your neighbor or rob him. Do not hold back the wages of a hired man overnight. Deuteronomy 24.14-15, do not take advantage of a hired man who is poor and needy, whether he is a brother Israelite or an alien living in one of your towns. Pay him his wages each day before sunset because he is poor and is counting on it. Otherwise, he may cry to the Lord against you, and you will be guilty of sin. 
God cares for the marginalized, and so should we. By the way, at the time that James was writing this, we know from history that it was a time of increasing wealth imbalance with nearly all the, the property and the land in the hands of just a few wealthy landowners. And there is a sense that both the wealthy landowners and the poor farm laborers were present in this faith community. So James is writing this with the the non-believing, wealthy, unjust landowners and rich and wealthy in mind, but there's a sense that within the people of faith, there are both wealthy and poor worshiping together. And and I can't help but think of the way we uh, in the Northwoods are wired and the way our community reflects a little bit or a lot of that kind of socioeconomic diversity. Uh, we have so many in the Northwoods region uh, that represent a measure of affluence, uh, second home folks, retirees, uh, even people passing through. Uh, there's a, a, a huge tourism industry here and um, a lot of vacationers and a sense of privilege and affluence. Uh, meanwhile, there are, are many, many, many who live either right at or just below or just above the poverty line. Uh, at the Needs Ministry in Eagle River, uh, each year we have over 500 families that pass through the doors of our um, pantry sort of facility that is there for those in need and people uh, seeking just direction for their next steps. And our partnership with Northwood Share and Needs Ministry and IC Help, IC Help is an acronym that stands for Interdenominational Churches, Helping, equipping, loving people. Um, our partnership with those ministries in the community, with our own benevolence ministry out of this church, are a really important part of who we are and uh, something that I'm, I, I feel strongly about. And I'm proud of the work that uh, a number of those in our community are doing to, to see those that God has blessed uh, provide in a responsible and a wise way for those that are in need. Um, that's who we are as a community. We totally, I think, um, in many ways, there's this uh, similarity between what James is talking about in this passage and who we are. Um, so I like to think of, of who we are as, um, as seeking to be active in an ongoing, hyper-personal, case-by-case kind of benevolence ministry in our community and live out um, this caring and helping those that are in need. We must never neglect that. That's the caution here as James paints the picture of a bleak future vision. Uh, it's a picture of hearts that are completely out of whack and frankly diseased, verses 5 and 6. Uh, you have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence, you have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Uh, injustice in action and fraud have led to luxury and self-indulgence, with the end result being fattened hearts, diseased souls. That's basically how the people of Sodom were described in Ezekiel 16, 49, overfed and unconcerned, and we know what God did to Sodom and Gomorrah. James is trying to explain that hoarding wealth and cheating workers leads to their demise. It is on par with murdering them. It is the same thing, which leads us to a bit of an echo of Jesus in the final verse of, of this bleak future vision. Verse 6 again, you have condemned, you have murdered the righteous person he does not resist you. Who does that make you think of? It makes me think of Christ on the cross and the way he willingly sacrificed uh, for our sins through crucifixion. Which side of this do we want to be on? Uh, the side that trusts Jesus or the side that killed him? The thief on the nearby cross that hurled insults or the other one who repented? 
Uh, that's the question and the, the inflection point that this picture of a bleak future vision from James 5, 1 through 6 leads us. For me, it was helpful in reading this to read it also in, uh, in the message version. So this is a paraphrase of James 5, 1 through 6, according to Eugene Peterson's The Message. And a final word to you, arrogant rich. Take some lessons in lament. You'll need buckets for the tears when the crash comes upon you. Your money is corrupt and your fine clothes stink. Your greedy luxuries are a cancer in your gut, destroying your life from within. You thought you were piling up wealth. What you've piled up is judgment. All the workers you've exploited and cheated cry out for judgment. The groans of the workers you used and abused are a roar in the ears of the master avenger. You've looted the earth and lived it up, but all you'll have to show for it is a fatter than usual corpse. In fact, what you've done is condemn and murder perfectly good persons who stand there and take it. I don't know about you, but it just leaves me somewhat shuddering, somewhat um, sobered by these words, if we slow down and we take them to heart and we take them seriously. It's a bleak future vision. Thankfully, there is another option. As long as there is breath in your lungs, it's not too late. There is a hopeful, imminent reality. That's James 5, verses 7 through 8. That's our call. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains? You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now, there is much more within these verses than we can cover in the time that we have left, but let me address just a few things. There is hope here, and it's based on the trusting patience of faith in Christ. The antidote to the form of heart disease that, that James presents to us in verses uh, 5 through 6, in verses 1 through 6, uh, the antidote of that is trusting and being patient in Jesus our Lord. It, it, it's a trusting patience and faith in Jesus our Lord. There's hope here, and it's based on the way we trust and are patient in Christ. In light of the return of Christ at a time that we don't know, and, and in light of the fact that that could possibly happen at any moment, in light of Jesus' return and the reality of our eternal future and where we will end up, we are called to be patient and to trust in Jesus. Uh, followers of Christ need to imitate the farmer. We need to be patient and diligent at the same time. Normally, patience in Scripture refers to the way we deal with people, and endurance deals with the way we, we work through difficulty. In James, those two things kind of overlap. And when he says be patient, he also means uh, uh, value endurance and strength and, um, and, and making it through. One theologian said uh, that James calls forth a certain resignation to the reality of suffering, but a constant expectation of its reversal someday. That's the patience of James. Farming is a really good analogy for this in verses uh, 7 and 8, in verse 7 in particular. Dependent on rain, diligent in work, expectant in hope for a bountiful harvest. Uh, farmers in that region were particularly dependent on the autumn, the late autumn rains and the early spring rains. And so they worked toward uh, a harvest all the time by planting seeds, uh, by, by being patient about uh, waiting for the rains and expectant for the harvest. And again, the patience called for for us through faith is in the Lord's provision in our life and in what he provides in, in his good time. 
work towards it by planting seeds in this life with other people, sharing the love and truth of Christ, but also being patient and hopeful. Endure suffering and hope for the harvest of righteousness and peace beyond measure. And finally, according to verse 8, establish your hearts. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Uh, This is something that only God can do. Only God strengthens our hearts. So this is a call to trust his character and be patient in this life. In other words, we could say, allow God to establish your hearts. Why? Because the coming of the Lord is at hand. Or another way to translate that is that the coming of the Lord is near. That's verse 8. It's the same Greek word that Jesus used when he he called people in his earthly ministry, ministry to repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. In terms of salvation history and all eternity, his coming is always near. Every generation is called to live in light of that imminence. A hopeful, imminent reality. So that's James 5, verses 1 through 8. And following the pattern of James, where he spends six verses on a bleak future vision, most of our time has been spent looking at what the misprioritization of the pursuit of wealth looks like in our lives. And it's a, a dark bleak future vision. He spent six verses on that and only two verses on a hopeful imminent reality. And so it leaves us focused quite a bit on where we don't want to end up. But that's important for us to do on occasion as we work our way through scripture and we follow the pattern of a book that we've chosen to go through. Because that's where the book takes us. And today, uh, James 5, 1 through 8 takes us in the direction of of imagining a future where our priorities are all out of whack before we get to imagine a future where God provides. So here's what I hear. Here's the caution. Wealth can warp your heart and wreck your life. Wealth itself easily messes with our priorities. It's not that wealth is always a bad thing, but it so easily draws us in the wrong direction. And if you look down that road, it's dark and bleak. So, if wealth can easily cause a form of heart disease, then the remedy is the trusting patience of faith in Christ. That's the bottom line. When it comes to the dangers of wealth, The antidote to a warped heart and a wrecked life is the kind of intentional endurance and awareness of the nearness of God and the person of Jesus. If wealth can easily cause a form of spiritual heart disease, then the remedy is the trusting patience of faith in Christ. And this is where I just want to remind us again that James often can feel like Uh, a gathering of sayings, but we need to be grounded in the reality that this is all a product of our relationship with the Lord Jesus. So it's not just about doing the right things or being a better person. It's about relying on the Lord to establish our heart, relying on Christ to lead us in his ways, remembering his second coming, And so I want to encourage you as you listen today, as you consider where you're at, most of us uh, that have the capability of of living in America and and tuning into a a service like this, a a message like this, are probably uh, leaning to the side or firmly in the area of privilege and affluence and wealth. Uh, We need to guard our hearts and be willing to see how the Lord would lead us to be good stewards of what he's given us. And our heart at St. Germain is to be a place where we can uh, use those resources wisely and be a community that is growing and building each other up in the love of Christ so that we can influence the surrounding community for Christ. So 
I would just ask you to pray about how God would you, have you use what he has blessed you with and that you would pray with us that we would be good stewards of the resources God has blessed us with. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, may we ground all that we do in our relationship and dependence and absolute surrender to you and your ways and your will. May we not live this life uh, unaware of where you lead us. May we not live this life unaware of how you establish our hearts through faith in Christ. So uh, allow this warning to sort of hit us today in a way that we need to be, to be cautioned and hit. And allow us to move forward in obedience to you, trusting you, um, looking to you all the while. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I want to I close actually with a benediction uh, for you even online today. And it comes from uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, where that phrase, establish your heart in the Greek, is used in the, um, that, that same Greek phrase is used in this passage. So receive this benediction. 1 Thessalonians 3, 11 to 13. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Amen. God bless you this week.